this webinar. So before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to poll the audience. So please um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you staff at a foundation, uh, staff at an infrastructure organization, perhaps you're staff at a nonprofit org, or maybe you're a board member of a foundation, or maybe you fall into another category that we haven't mentioned here. So please take a second to um, tell us a little bit about where you're coming from. And uh, I'm going ahead now and close the poll and I'm gonna share the results. And it seems like hmm. um, quite a number of you are staff at a foundation. So that's, that's good to know. And um, today's speakers, we have Christine Reeves, who is Senior Field Associate at the National Center for Responsive Philanthropy. And Regina McGraw, who is Executive Director of the Webolt Foundation which is based in Chicago. And so I'm going to um, now turn it over to them and I'll be running the slides for, for both of you. So um, let me switch over to the other slides. And um, take it away, Christine and Regina. Well, thank you so much, Emily and Michael and uh, Rasan. Uh, my name is Christine Reeves, and I'm a senior field associate at the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy, and I'm also um, a board member of EPIP and the vice chair of the DC chapter of EPIP. And, and I'm Regina. Mc I'm sorry, Christine. Go ahead. Oh, take it away, Regina. Oh, and I'm Regina McGraw, and as mentioned, I'm the director of the Webolt Foundation in Chicago. Great. So next slide. So we just wanted to kick things off by just letting you know a little bit about where we're coming from. Everyone has a point of entry, a story. Um, we joined uh, our philanthropic sector for a reason. Most people who I talk to, it's more of a calling than a nine to five job. So my background is I grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, where most people tend to go to retire. I uh, am the daughter of a teacher and a former sports reporter. And I grew up very shy. And when I was in fifth grade, my mom taught fifth grade, and uh, she introduced me to one of her students who was very into theater. And that helped me come out of my shell and I started volunteering and joining student government. And I volunteered at a migrant farm worker camp in high school. And I didn't have a vocabulary for what I was witnessing, but I, it just felt wrong. And, you know, over there felt even more wrong. And it wasn't until college and graduate school where I learned a social justice vocabulary, a political science vocabulary, a policy vocabulary, and tried to think of how can we address systemic roots of problems in our society, but from a non-paternalistic way. And I also grew up on a lot of uh, healthy doses of the West Wing and wanted to be C.J. Craig. And in graduate school, I had three professors who actually used to run philanthropic organizations. And I thought that that was such an interesting vehicle for positive social change. So I've been at NCRP since then. Um, and I just was, uh, as I was preparing with Regina, my co-author for this, I was thinking about it last night when we had our DC chapter holiday party. And I could think of a few times in my life where I felt like I was with my people. Uh, one's when I'm with my family, one was my high school drama, one was a poli-sci conference in college, one is my church here in DC, and um, the most recent being the EPIP 2010 National Conference. And when I came, I just thought, wow, these are all these passionate people who are excited about social change and contributing to our society. So thank you for all of the work you do, and I look forward to sharing our work with you and uh, having a discussion at the end. And this is Regina here. Uh, the older you are, the longer the story, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I actually grew up in a suburb of New Jersey, but I went to school in Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, which is a machine city, and that held me very much in good stead when I moved to Chicago. Uh, when I was first came to Chicago, I got a job canvassing for a community organization, so I basically went door to door asking for money, 
Um, and strangely enough, I was successful at it and became interested in community organizing. But as I became more and more interested in community organizing, I thought to myself, it's really not about systemic change, it's about individual change. So I actually went into training to be a therapist and worked on a psychiatric unit. And after a couple years of that, thought, well, you know, people live in communities, they live in neighborhoods, they live in towns. If the place where they live is not healthy, how are they ever going to be able to achieve full self-actualization or whatever we want to call it? So I thought, well, there's system change, there individ there's individual change, beats the heck out of me. So I became a public relations person at a social service agency uh, that worked with homeless and immigrants and refugees. Um, and I enjoyed the work, but I missed actually being in a position to be able to influence any kind of system. So after that job, I got a job with the Children's Advocacy Organization, and I enjoyed that as well, but the kind of strange thing to me was that we never talked to the parents on the ground who were dealing with the issues affecting their children, and we also didn't talk to the frontline professionals uh, who were working with these children. So we did a lot of work about uh, abuse of children, but we never talked to folks, other, I did, but no, I never got across the idea that we should be talking to people uh, who work for the Department of Children and Family Services because they're frontline folks. Uh, and unfortunately, the advocacy organization likes listening to experts and looking at studies um, and figuring out what was best for children in Illinois. So I decided to think about community organizing and the WeVolt job came up. And WeVolt is known actually both in Chicago and the country for giving general operating support to community organizing. Uh, it's over 90 years old. And the change from social service to organizing happened in the 60s. Um, so I've been here for a long time and it is an enormous uh, pleasure to work here. I get to go out and visit neighborhoods and see amazing people. Um, and folks are very happy to see me, not only because I'm a funder, but also because we give general operating support uh, and we don't tell people to go away after three years. Uh, There's some groups that we have funded for 15 years. Uh, so that would be my story. Christine, back to you. Great. So uh, next slide. So there are two main things that we want to do in the next 60 minutes or so, and uh, we're going to show that. So there's sort of a twin purpose. Next slide. So one is um, on the sort of um, logistical side of things. Uh, Regina and I are co-authors, so we wanted to be able to touch on what it's like to co-author an article. Um, I think that a lot of people are blogging nowadays, but when you're able to write 1,500 to 2,000 word plus articles, um, I think you're able to get a lot more thoughts out. And it's been a pleasure to work with Regina, who um, is becoming quite a mentor to me. And maybe some of you on the call are thinking of um, how you can work with your mentors, because so often as a mentee, it can feel like you're the only one gaining, but when you're able to find common projects with mentors, such as writing, um, it can be a really helpful um, way to keep in touch and to help your mentor in some ways. And then the second aspect of it uh, is to talk about this concept of democratic philanthropy. So it's this sort of phrase we thought of, um, and we're going to talk to you about what we think it's about. And I've been talking a little bit about it as I've gone across the country. I travel a lot for my day job. And I was able to have uh, seven presentations with EPIP chapters across the country and um, started floating some of these ideas. So next slide. Regina? Yeah. So um, we started the article actually with the old saying that if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and the reason that we said that is because we were thinking about how funders view the people who make use of the programs that they fund. And we started thinking about the notion of charity and the notion of giving help to low-income communities. Uh, and I think that no matter how sympathetic or empathetic a funder may be, 
uh, there is a way in which if you provide social services, you are removed from the people that are receiving that help and you are also not interacting with them on a level where you can truly understand what it is uh, that they need to be able to feed their families, to get employment, et cetera. So I think we wanted to push the notion that, of course, food pantries are important. Of course, it's important to fund things that people, for example, here in Chicago, undocumented immigrants were just granted the right to um, apply for driver's licenses, which is a huge thing. So some funders are actually funding legal services for these undocumented so that they will be able to do that. And that's a great program and it's not organizing. But having said that, the important notion here is that the way that that legislation was passed was there were a number of immigrant groups who came together to pressure the legislators in Springfield to get that legislation passed. Uh, so even if democratic philanthropy is just a small part or a beginning part of your funding portfolio, uh, I do think that the nail can be seen, to, to spread the analogy out way too far, the nail could be seen as victims of our economic downturn or it could be seen as folks who are experiencing difficulties but who have creative ideas about how uh, those difficulties could be solved and the organizing perspective is what public policy uh, would need to change to make that happen. Okay. So, um, next slide. So, I guess we're the next step we're going to talk about is this idea of charity versus democratic philanthropy. And we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. If you ask 10 people um, a definition for charity and a definition for democratic philanthropy, you would get 10 different answers. But um, for the hope of brevity and also um, to really delve into this a little more, we're going to tell you what we've come to think about it and we'd love to hear from you about your thoughts. But we don't necessarily see charity <clears throat> as a bad thing. It can be a very useful tool, um, but we think that there are limits to it and sometimes charity can unintentionally exacerbate existing disparities and can unintentionally be paternalistic or not as inclusive as it could be. So we're seeing democratic philanthropy as something beyond charity. We believe a democracy involves and even requires residents to confront challenges facing them in their communities. And this is important because the process and outcomes of charity, in addition to doing good work, can sometimes unintentionally reinforce victimization or paternalism. So we cannot limit ourselves to relying on those who give philanthropy to also be the ones who identify which problems to prioritize and which solution strategies to pursue. So um, all of this that we're taking from is from an article, you can Google it if you'd like, uh, Democratic Philanthropy, A Different Perspective on Funding. It's a four-page article, short and sweet, but um, as we go through the rest of the presentation, we'll tell you more about our definition. But first, I wanted to talk about why this is important, this differentiation between charity and democratic philanthropy. Next slide. So we have some urgent problems. Every year there are roughly 90,000 gun-related deaths in the United States. Also, every year, if you can continue, there it, we are seeing the effects of climate change, which have been unparalleled and we still don't fully grasp. Also, one in five children are food insecure in this country on our watch, meaning one in five children don't know when or where they will receive their next meal, not in Somalia, in the United States. And also, uh, roughly 600,000 people on any given day in the United States are homeless. That's roughly the size of the average congressional district. And in philanthropy, we have very limited dollars. Uh, we're not able to give as much as we would like to this, uh, like to do to this. And uh, often in presentations, I give out a few numbers, 3 billion, 45 billion, and 58 billion, and ask if anyone knows what they mean. 3 billion is how much the Gates Foundation gives away every year. 45 billion is how much all U.S. philanthropy gives away 
each year, and $58 billion is the state of California's education budget. So it shows that we have these urgent problems, and we also have very limited resources. So what are we to do? Next slide. So as we were talking about what democratic philanthropy means to us, three things kept reoccurring to us. One is democratic philanthropy has the goal of addressing root causes of problems, not just immediate solutions or band-aids on broken legs. Two, we see it as a laboratory, um, a vehicle or a laboratory for positive social change. And three, we see it as not just serving an underserved or marginalized community as a recipient of charity, but we see it as empowering that community as a participant in the process. So root causes of problems, laboratory, laboratory for positive social change, and also empowering, not just giving to um, those underserved or marginalized communities. Next slide. So a neat parallel that I thought could help in terms of breaking this down um, actually has to do with endowments. And a lot of people in foundations are more involved on the programmatic side than on the operation side. But most foundations that have endowments that aren't spend down foundations, um, most give away about 5% uh, to their grant making, whereas 95% is invested. And it would probably not be the wisest thing if you told your financial advisor to invest all of your endowment, 95% of what you have, in a single company. That would be incredibly risky if anything happened. Instead, you diversify, right? Um, even if you're talking about your individual investments. So we kind of see it the same way in terms of your grant making strategy with your 5%. So although we're not pitting any issue against any other issue, we're not saying it's more important to fund health than environment or arts than homelessness, we're not saying that. But regardless, whatever issue you're inspired by, whatever issue has driven your foundation's philanthropy, um, consider the strategies you use for getting there. So um, this is incredibly helpful because when you invest all in just one strategy, such as direct service or scholarships, you might not be able to diversify as much as you would like. So we'll get more into this in a moment. Next slide. So another thing that comes to mind is I keep, as I go to a lot of conferences, I keep having this thought in my head of, is philanthropy trying to become the new math? So often we're just really interested in metrics and evaluations and how we can show the needle moving and the bar charts growing. And although there's something to be said about that being helpful, we also don't want to cut off our nose to spite our face. So if we were in the business of just watching those bar charts grow, of just seeing results, I think we would all be in the business of giving away lunches because you can easily go from giving out 100 lunches a day to 100,000 lunches a day. But the question we then pose is what about dinner? What about breakfast the day after that? Uh, how are we actually solving the issue of hunger? And looking at things like um, ethnic, racial, um, economic, etc., disparities that could be a um, a source or a root cause of hunger. And even if your foundation is mainly focused on direct service of providing immediate need, food, shelter, and clothing, you can still use democratic philanthropy as a lens for your process, not just your outcomes. So maybe it would look like still giving out the meals, but consulting those who are receiving the meals and asking them, you know, where are the best places to set up our food banks so that they're accessible? Or to say, you know, we are wanting to give out direct service work, but is food really what's most needed? Maybe it's job training that people would actually say they would need the most. So who is a part of the conversation as well as how are we actually carrying out our grant making work? So just to consider those strategies. Next slide. Regina? Yes, okay, so uh, the Weibo Foundation, as I mentioned, has been around for over 90 years. Uh, the original $4 million for the foundation uh, was gotten from a chain of department stores here in Chicago that were started by the Weibo family. 
Uh, they were stores that were in neighborhoods, uh, and I would sort of maybe equate them with Kohl's. It, um, they really were geared to middle class and working people. And in the 60s, uh, Chicago was going through quite a bit of change in terms of civil rights issues, um, and there was a strong emphasis on beginning community organizing. So the director at that time went out to meet with some of the organizers and the groups and then involved board members in going out with him to meet with talented organizers and to meet with expressive, I guess is the word, leaders. So it didn't happen in a vacuum. It really happened when thinking about what was going on in Chicago at that time and given the foundation's limited funds, how could they be used most effectively. Um, the actual change in focus came about probably over about a year and a half so that the board got their feet wet by funding a couple of community organizations but continued to fund social services and then after about a year and a half of funding community organizing um, and seeing what it was able to accomplish, the board made the leap of faith to change the guidelines. Now, one of the things I know family foundations worry about is donor intent and is changing one's, um, what, whatever you find, is it, would, the, would the original donor be pleased about it? Well, the Weibo Foundation was a little bit lucky in that respect in that the founders of the foundation motto was to start a charity designed to put an end to the need for charity. Um, and also the stores were in neighborhoods. Uh, Marshall Fields was downtown, but we both stores were in the neighborhoods of Chicago. Community organizing is definitely trying to put an end to charity. I mean, and also uh, neighborhoods are the focus of community organizing. So it did kind of fit, although frankly, I also think it was a little bit of revisionist history as the decision was being made. Um, the other thing that I should explain is that the board members who are family members at WeVote come from the professional class. We have bankers, um, investment advisors, uh, teachers, uh, a variety of professional people. They realize that their expertise and experience was really not broad enough if the foundation was going to fund effective organizing. So we now, they decided in the 60s to invite community members to be a part of the board uh, and that tradition continues to this day and the community members are listened to with great respect uh, because the board knows that they are the ones who are out and about in the city every day uh, seeing what is actually happening at the grassroots level. The board members have said over and over again that they enjoy going out to meet with leaders and going out to neighborhoods to see what's going on. And I soon realized after I started this job that my job was really to get out of the way. Um, I'm doing a job of thinking about should we fund this organization or not. The organizer is thinking, oh dear, I have to make, you know, I want to get this money, I have to make my budget goals. But the leaders and the board members are both volunteers and they have phenomenally productive discussions. And I often think that the one thing that our, our family board really gets is entrepreneurial spirit and investing in individuals um, because that's what they have done in their professional lives. And the leaders of our organizations really have that same entrepreneurial spirit that ability to be able to connect with people in a very profound way uh, and the board members really respond to that. So I, I go back to my notion of getting out of the way and letting the board members really see what is going on on the ground. Uh, the things that we look for, the board is very much in favor of and just to quickly say over the years, um, all of our guidelines and all of our thinking has really been narrowed down to uh, we ask groups to identify issues, to do formal leadership development, to collaborate with other groups, to have innovative program, and to have public policy change that positively affects low-income families. 
Um, the other thing that we often talk about and probably don't talk about enough is that these kinds of funding priorities really do encourage community cohesion, which I guess is a new buzzword of sorts, but it also fosters civic responsibility because it forces people, basically, if they're, if they're willing and able, to become a part of the discussion of how we can improve uh, Chicago's low-income communities. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of talent and a lot of meetings, um, and it, I'm constantly amazed that people are willing to take time out of their busy schedules uh, to be part of the community organizing process. So we are now in our 92nd year. Um, about 10 years ago, no, I guess it was 20 years ago now. I'm not going to remember. But there was a big anniversary where we actually asked thought leaders around the city to think about should we continue to fund organizing or not. And the resounding uh, cry was yes, organizing does need to be funded. It's a good thing. And we are very grateful that we have a WeVolt Foundation in Chicago. So that is the story of WeVolt. Christine? Great. Uh, next slide. All right. So I just wanted to take a step back after that excellent example, and I'm so glad that Regina was able to kind of give her perspective as being a leader of a foundation. Um, so what I wanted to address is just the elephant in the room. So what is community organizing? Why is it that when it's mentioned, sometimes I see some visceral reactions on faces? Um, so I wanted to mention three things. One is um, to kind of understand a spectrum, if you will, of different strategies uh, of philanthropy. So regardless of whether you're funding education, health, arts, regardless of whether it's in Chicago or Seattle or Kenya, um, what are different strategies that can be used? So there's everything, you know, that is often brought up that can be called direct service or social services. There's scholarships, there's self-help programs, there's research, but what about applications of democratic philanthropy? So um, at NCRP, we often refer to three main applications, one being civic engagement. There's many different ways this can be uh, defined. One example might be um, voter registration, you know, actually engaging citizens that way. Um, moving along the, a continuum, um, there's advocacy as an application. So that's often when one group represents the interests of another group. There, that's a very simplistic definition for a very complex uh, topic. Um, but just to give you an idea of that. And then third, kind of going further to what Regina was talking about, is community organizing or just organizing. And a way I often describe it succinctly is when one group might help another group represent themselves so that they don't need an advocate, they are their own advocates. So very grassroots focused. Again, there are so many different definitions we could use, but I just thought that that might be helpful to bring up. The second thing I wanted to touch on was why is this an elephant in the room? Why would community organizing or advocacy or civic engagement for that matter be perhaps taboo? And uh, why is it that in a sector like philanthropy where we're not getting, you know, elected again or anything like that, why might people be hesitant to talk about these things? And perhaps by framing it like with this phrase democratic philanthropy where who could be against democracy uh, might be a more palatable way to discuss it and to lead with definitions and examples and how it affects people's lives. But at the same time, I don't know if many of you remember this, but about a year ago, there was a lot of talk about the charitable deduction. I don't know how anyone feels about it. Some people are for it or against uh, changing it. Some people like me believe it's one part of a constellation of issues that we could address at a national level about philanthropy. But um, if you recall, so many foundations were organizing um, themselves to explain to Congress and to the President how important the charitable deduction was. They were organizing and advocating for philanthropy. However, only 8% um, of foundations give at least a quarter of their grant making towards civic engagement, advocacy, or community organizing. And the median amount a foundation gives is just 2% of their grant making dollars towards these democratic philanthropy applications. And if you pause for a moment, 
imagine if the median percent of direct, imagine if the median amount of direct service or social services grant making was just a median of 2%. There would be a lot of problems. So again, bringing you back to that eggs visual, imagine diversifying your strategies and seeing how oh, there can be an incredible return on investments when using these strategies. Next slide. So again, just to have a little word play uh, and a little fun with it, levity is always a good thing. Um, we were referring to advocacy as the scarlet letter of philanthropy. And one sort of call to action that I've been trying to uh, throw out there is just to use the word, to have conversations about it, not to let advocacy or organizing for that matter uh, be left off the agenda and um, to have questions about it, to do research about it. And um, in this final part of our presentation, we'll talk about some next steps that you can take and uh, we'll go from there. So next slide. All right, oh, so yeah. we're now no, going to list, um, if you can go one more slide for next steps and ideas. So Regina, uh, so I think, yeah. Yeah, I had the light bulb ideas and steps visual. Oh, I'm sorry. Please That's go back. Okay. No, well, I apologize. One sec. That's okay. Let's go back one slide and I'll start talking. Um, there's actually three conclusions that Christine and I came to when uh, doing this article, and I'm going to read them quickly. Uh, the first one is that independent of the issue, geography, or community that motivates your foundation's philanthropy, Democratic strategies may help you better meet your mission and achieve greater quantitative and qualitative returns on investment. Uh, in Chicago, we have found that in a lot of different areas, but most recently in the areas of education reform and the need for increased affordable housing. And if anybody wants to know more about that, I'd be happy to share it. Second, phrases like social change philanthropy, grassroots strategies, economic justice grant making, or advocacy and organizing funding may put off some funders. Yet before making up our minds about these phrases, let's take a moment to look beyond the language to see the definition, applications, examples, and people of democratic philanthropy. And third, it might be helpful for you to consider where your foundation falls on the continuum of traditional charity, which we would call transactional to democratic philanthropy, which we would note is transformational, both in terms of the outcomes you seek and the processes by which you seek them. So next, as Christine mentioned, we have collected some reoccurring questions that people have about funding democratic philanthropy. And Christine, I will hand it over to you. Great. Okay, so in the article, um, in actually it's on page 10 of the journal that the article is published in, we put a one-page chart together. And as we do our work and travel the country, uh, we often hear one of at least 10 questions that people pose about democratic philanthropy and its applications. So social justice applications, advocacy, organizing, civic engagement. So we listed these 10 questions and in the second column, for each question, we posed a conversation starter to kind of be a little bit of a devil's advocate or consider a different uh, perspective or recognize an assumption. And then in the third column, we put a potential resource, uh, an article or a website that might be good to explore further. Uh, so for the first one, we get a lot of questions about, is it too political? And one potential conversation starter might be, um, advocating for change is political, you're right but so is not advocating, i.e. quietly advocating for the status quo. So maybe we could reframe this question to should we be nonpartisan or non-present because it's going to be political either way. And the second one that we got was uh, does it threaten donor intent? And Regina touched on this a little bit earlier, but our conversation starter was most donors outline issues, communities, or places where they want to fund, but they usually don't um, get as specific as the particular strategies on how to get there. So for instance, um, if you're trying to um, fight 
uh, poverty or something, um, you might look into uh, food pantries, which is wonderful and important. I volunteered at food pantries before. But um, you also might be like a group, uh, the Partnership for Safety and Justice in Portland, Oregon, where they were going to look at prison recidivism and organize different communities across uh, Portland and across the state uh, to actually end up saving the state of Oregon over a billion dollars because the prison that was on track to be built didn't need to be built because uh, there wasn't enough crime due to all of their great work. And we put a quantitative value on the part we could, but at the same time, you can't put a quantitative value for the return on investment of what it's like for a child to have no parents in prison or um, the fewer cops on the streets or property values going up in certain areas because there's less crime. Third, uh, what if I don't know of nonprofits that do this work? Well, we might suggest um, thinking about how you can reach out to more community members to get ideas. And uh, a lot of times, actually one of the examples that I put in the article with Regina is that imagine you're uh, working at a women's foundation. Would you hire or select um, a board of all men, no matter how compassionate and empathetic they were, no matter how many wives and sisters and daughters they had, you probably wouldn't. So at the same time, if that women's foundation's working on homelessness, would it be appropriate to ask, would um, any of our board members or staff members, have any of them ever experienced homelessness or known someone who's experienced homelessness? And if not, how can we engage in that community better to know their needs? Who can we reach out to? Fourth, is it legal? So yes, it's absolutely legal to fund in these ways. And there's a big difference between civic engagement, advocacy and organizing, and an even bigger difference between those things in lobbying, which nonprofits and 501c3s can still do. And the Alliance for Justice has tremendous resources explaining um, what can and cannot be done. So often foundations don't want to step over a line that they might step too far back um, in front of it. And fifth, um, how can I measure it? So this is again going back to the lunches example, but is the goal to fund what can be measured easily or to fund what is most needed and then creatively find a way to evaluate it? And we hope that it's the latter. So Regina, we'll do six through 10. Yes, uh, number six on our list, is, I feel like David Letterman, but anyway, number six <laughs> on our list is what if advocacy community organizing makes me, and I would add, or my board uncomfortable. Um, and I want to say a couple of things about that. One is there's really no such thing as a board of directors in the sense that there's a collection of individuals with varying views on topics. And I know that as a community organizer, one should never go into a meeting unless you know what's going to happen. And the only way that you know what's going to happen is if you've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with each board member. Uh, to see what they're thinking about. Do you think what we're doing is effective? Do you feel like you're getting enough information about refunds? Um, I think that one-on-one -on -one contact is really uh, very important. Uh, the second thing is that I know that Alinsky-style organizing continues to be the thing that people think about, but organizing has actually changed quite a bit. There's still conflict. Uh, there's still sometimes angry groups of people protesting something. Uh, but it has a lot more finesse, I would argue, than it did years ago. Um, and what we think is that it's worth having a conversation with your board members. And there's two resources. Uh, the Grand Makers for Southern Progress have two publications, Words Matter and As the South Goes Reports, uh, that you would be able to look at. All of these are in the article on the NCRP website which I have to say, Christine, you all have done a wonderful job. Anything you need to know about anything having to do with philanthropy, you can find it there. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Okay, so what if my board isn't ready? Okay, I think I covered that. The only thing that I would add is that site visits, learning tours with funders that already do this, um, or sharing resources is a very important thing. The other thing we have found, too, is we've been doing a collaborative project on education reform with other funders. 
Um, and there's a lot of cover for the funders that are part of that, that if they want to dip their toe into organizing, but not the whole foot, um, this gives staff, before board members, staff the opportunity to be around funders of organizing and around the work that's being done. And of course, if the collaborative includes you, you are interested in education reform, and so you're learning about how community organizing uh, might bring about that change. Um, so the collaborative efforts, I think, are very, very um, strategically important. Does it take a long time to measure results? Uh, we have a publication called Leveraging Limited Dollars and Real Results. Also, there is an article in the current issue of NCRP where our article is, where a woman named Lori Belzer from Hazen Foundation really did a great article about using the business model uh, to achieve results. Um, I'm not saying that elegantly, uh, but I think that would be worth a look at. Are advocacy organizing issues or strategies? They are strategies and they are not particular um, goals. And I think that uh, it's a different strategy than direct service, but it is a strategy. Uh, and if a foundation has particular goals in whatever issue area it is, poverty, education, housing, homelessness, etc., cetera, uh, advocacy and or organizing would be a way for the foundation to achieve its objectives in the funding that they give. Um, there's also, in, in NCRP, there's a thing called High Impact Strategies in Philanthropy, which you could take a look at. Uh, lastly, is it time consuming and difficult to learn about this work? Um, you could consider reverse engineering your mission statement and see if one of these might work. Uh, you might consider funding a project, uh, sorry, a pilot project grant or hiring a consultant who specializes in this. My own thought, I have to share as a last comment, is it's so darn fun. Um, you get to go to community congresses, you get to meet leaders and communities, you get to go to schools. Um, funding organizing, I have to say, is fun. Um, you're not seeing people who are hungry getting food, you are seeing people who are hungry who are angry and who really want to do something about it, and they want to include other people in doing something about it. Um, so I can't underestimate the amount of fun you will have if you go out to neighborhoods or to parts of the country um, and talk to these amazing individuals um, who are part of the movement in this country uh, to make a difference. So that would be my, my last uh, statement on that. <laughs> so Christine? Okay, so that's our David Letterman <laughs> wrap up. <laughs> um, but I just, uh, I think it might be, um, I don't know, maybe my type A personality, which I'm hoping can remain a lowercase type A, but I always like action items and being able to go to a good session at a conference or read an article and think, okay, but what can I do next? That was interesting, but am I going to remember it in a couple days? So hopefully something in here resonated with you, but we're now just going to turn it over to some question and answers on the next slide, and I believe Emily has another um, poll. I do. I have a couple of other poll questions. Um, now it's, it's our chance to engage you, the audience, um, to find out what's happening on your end in your work uh, with regard to um, democratic practices. So, um, so take a look at this question. Which of these concerns is of most importance in your democratic philanthropy work? Is it too political? Um, does it threaten donor intent? What if I don't know of nonprofits that do this work? Is it legal? Um, and how can I measure it? What is uh, the biggest concern for your work in this area? So take a minute to vote, please. And, um, and we'll, we'll close the poll in a couple of seconds. Um, this is an interesting question, and I think it, it takes a little bit of time to think about, so, um, but we appreciate your participation in this poll. So I'm going to go ahead and close it and share the results so everybody can see. Um, and it looks like um, some of these concerns are, are, are across the board. Christine and uh, Regina, can you see the results? Yes. yes. Okay, good. 
That's great. So, um, and we have, we have one other poll and this one is, uh, also in relation to the previous one. Um, how about these concerns? Are, uh, are any of these concerns in the work that you're doing right now uh, with regard to democratic philanthropy? Is what if advocacy community organizing makes me uncomfortable? What if my board isn't ready? Does it take a long time to measure these results? Are advocacy and organizing issues or strategies? And is it time consuming and difficult to learn about this work? So what are your biggest concerns about advocacy and community organizing. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results. This seems like uh, oh. this is, <laughs> this one's pretty uniform. Very interesting. That is interesting. And actually for that um, one of my board isn't ready, uh, one of the things that we mentioned in the article is, you know, boards aren't necessarily a lot of representative of the community that the foundation is trying to serve and sometimes like those site visits Regina mentioned or um, having community advisory committees to advise the board who might not experience the kind of problems that the community is experiencing um, might be interesting but it could also be <laughs> lead to a great discussion about board composition in the US for foundations. Um, I, would, I would also say we actually just did something uh, for the Association of Small Foundations um, and the representative of Webolt was the chair of our board uh, whose husband develops housing, who lives in a wealthy suburb, um, who is from the same sort of social status of the board. So if the board isn't ready because if, if I may be blunt, somebody who looks like them hasn't said it's a good thing. Um, I will offer Jenny for every any phone conversation you want, but you might also consider seeing who, who is out there who's funding or organizing as a piece of what they do, and is there somebody there that your board might be uh, wanting to talk to? Because I think, I, I, and I do agree, it's a little bit hard. You're not going to walk into your board and say, I've seen the light, let's fund organizing. Uh, but I think you can have a strategy for maybe finding a collaboration or what if we want affordable housing? I just heard of a housing group. You know, it will take some detective work on your part. Um, the other thing, and I, this is your own level of comfort, but I love that this is EPIP because uh, I have a friend who worked at a foundation that we won't name, but the foundation only did public policy. And he went out to see a school reform, I'm sorry, a community group, and there were two rats scurrying across. Um, and he thought to himself, okay, this is real work. And he sort of had an individual campaign, and he was able to get this public policy group to fund some organizing vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, education reform. So. I, I think if you want to be a leader in philanthropy, and secondly, you know, a lot of you know the truth. A lot of board members don't know the truth. And the truth is that this country is going through a phenomenally difficult time of income inequality. And I think a lot of us are canaries in the mine. And unfortunately, we can't chirp. Uh, we have to figure out how to get the word out in a loud and forceful way. Um, so I'm sort of saying two things. One is, you know, I think you have to be a loud and forceful uh, voice, but the other thing is you have to be very strategic about how you do it. I'm completely um, aware of that. Yeah, and another thing is I think there there's different ways to reach different people, and Regina really hit it on the head where it's not one board, it's 10 or 12 different people, right, that compose a board and they each have different points of entry and different perspectives and we shared our story at the very beginning you know each board member has their story and as is often said in philanthropy it's a second or third career or something they just kind of fell into sideways sometimes or it can be very intentional but I think quantitative return on investment statistics 
really motivate some board members. Other board members, it's more the qualitative storytelling. Whose lives are we impacting? Other times, it's all about relationship. If I trust an executive director of a nonprofit, I'll fund them, whether they're doing organizing or advocacy or direct service. And still other times, it's just more of like a gut instinct or um, just not necessarily knowing what's best, but trusting um, the leadership of the foundation to guide them in that way. And if a foundation doesn't want to fund democratic philanthropy in its applications that we went through, you know, that's the choice of the foundation. But if they're not funding it because it's not even brought up as an option in board meetings because it might be taboo, then that could be something to consider. And again, just to mention the um, charitable deduction concept where foundations that only fund direct service and social services were jumping up to organize themselves to let Congress know how important the charitable deduction is and should stay the same. But um, so few of those foundations give money to their grantees to organize on behalf of impoverished communities or homeless communities. So um, I think it's helpful to step back and ask some questions of ourselves. One of my favorite quotes is uh, Mary Jones, and she says, uh, also known as Mother Jones, uh, my job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And in philanthropy, I think we're all comfortable. Anyone living on more than $2 a day, arguably, is comfortable when half the world can't say that. So it can be a good exercise to ask ourselves tough questions. But on that note, um, please let us know if you guys have any questions for us. Yeah, so um, uh, this is the Q&A portion of the webinar, so um, I'm going to jump in and ask uh, a couple of questions that I have here. Um, uh, can, you, uh, can you talk about what if a foundation is only interested in funding social services? How, how should, uh, let's say an EPIT member works for such an organization, how could they get them to see the importance of funding advocacy or organizing? Mm -hmm. I, I, this is Regina here. Um, I, I can just tell a story, which is there's a wonderful woman who looks, works for a foundation that does direct service. Uh, but she was actually able to, but they're interested in more affordable housing. And so she was able to put together a collaboration of groups to work on more affordable housing um, and never actually use the word organizing, but use the goal of can we have X number of units uh, in the city by the next two years. And she was very, very clever in that. However, I have to say, if your foundation wants to do direct service and really is not interested in changing, we always have to understand who signs our paycheck. I think that's very important. Uh, and I think it's worth trying. It's worth being creative. And I'm willing to help anybody to help think about how to be creative. Uh, but on the other hand, sometimes you cannot change people's minds. And you don't drive yourself crazy trying to. Yeah, I'd also just recommend a publication called Leveraging Limited Dollars. It's eight or nine pages. It's a summary report of seven different reports across the country that track the return on investment and qualitative results of funding community organizing and advocacy over a three-year process. And it found that for every $1 foundations invested, there was a $115 return. That prison in Oregon was an example. Um, and sometimes just having something to read can be helpful. Um, that's great. Uh, we, ha we have another question here um, uh, from Simone, um, who asks, um, is, does organizational capacity building play any sort of role or support for organizational capacity, um, capacity building play any sort of role in democratic philanthropy? Uh, Christine, you want to go first? Um, well, organize. So I think there, that's one of those sort of fuzzier phrases, which means a lot of different things. Um, it can mean like um, organizational capacity building. That could be general operating support. That could be technical assistance. That could be trainings. There's so many different ways foundations um, apply that phrase. 
Um, and I think it definitely could be. And another thing to consider is we're talking about democratic philanthropy in both the outcomes, so funding, advocacy, organizing, civic engagement, but also the process in terms of making the process of philanthropy more inclusive and transparent and um, including those most affected in the decision-making process. So if you're funding um, capacity building um, around a topic like homelessness, um, you know, are the, some of the people at the table homeless people letting you know um, what their needs are? And um, another example is when you're working with children, you're almost always advocating for them. Um, so those are just different ideas. So I think it, it definitely could be. I just, I think it, um, it's a little more nuanced, so it depends probably on the foundation and the given circumstance. But um, my short answer would be yes. <laughs> um, and I'll, t I'll just tell a quick story which is about you know, 12 years ago the Ford Foundation uh, came in with capacity building money for community organizations um, and at that time people used the money for really exotic things like a new Xerox machine, um, a uh, paper clips, I mean electricity. Uh, th at that time organizations were very small and definitely needed some capacity building uh, help. Um, the good news now is that 12 years on, the average budget of our grantees has risen to about 800,000. Um, but I would say in areas where organizing is not as robust or long-term, capacity building is very important. Do we have time for one more question? Sure. Okay. <laughs> So um, this one's from Amy who writes in, since racial equity is at the core of community organizing work, how do you bring up such a sensitive subject without people feeling defensive about their privilege? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> For the last 30 seconds. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I think, um, you know, I was uh, talking with someone recently and this, this exact question sort of came up and uh, this um, woman was saying that she uh, doesn't feel like even though she's white she has much, much privilege. She comes from a blue collar background. She was saying how her grandfather fought in the war, then you know began working and all this stuff. And as we, I kind of talked with her about the trajectory of her family history, she realized you know although I come from a blue class, blue collar background, my grandfather got the GI Bill, which a lot of African, African Americans were excluded from, um, was hired at a company that didn't hire any African Americans till the 1990s. And th there were several examples like that. So um, there is some privilege, there are many different kinds of privilege, but I think part of it is just being able to um, talk about it gently and respectfully, to share your own story first before expecting other people to join in on the conversation, to be a good listener, um, insert levity when you can, and not to allow things to become taboo because that's just um, hurting everybody. Um, and Amy, I would say uh, actually our, our sister foundation, the Woods Fund, they have a racial lens in what they do. Um, I could lie, but I won't. Our family board members do not want to have that conversation, will not have that conversation, um, and feel that their uh, good works is funding community organizing. Our community members, of course, are very different, but there's no way that I can force that conversation. Um, and as long as the board continues to fund important work, um, I'm hoping you all that are emerging leaders in philanthropy will have more ammunition to be able to do that. Uh, but at this, at this particular historic moment, I am simply not able to do that with family members. Um, so there you go. Well, great. Well, thank you um, both, Christine and Regina, for your time today and this fantastic presentation. We really value your time and your expertise. And we want to thank our audience for attending and for your really interesting conversations and uh, questions. So um, we will be sharing a recording of this webinar on the EPIP uh, blog. So look out for that. And you all should have received a link to um, the article that um, appeared in the NCRP uh, magazine. And, um, but we'll send that out again in case you missed it the first time around. 
And, um, and thanks everybody for your time and have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um,